Hi, Massimo. Hi, everybody joining in. Um, wonderful to have been invited for this. Um, I've been asked to make a brief introduction about um, the program itself. So um, without much further ado, let me do that. Um, so welcome to the book club. Uh, the book club started in response to the need to discuss different genres of sci-fi and SSF books, uh, which intersected with the interests of technology and book geek communities. Um, Fija Lakshmi, Harish, and Gautam Shinoi are the early creators of Book Club at Hasgeek, and Book Club also invites discussions on books on AI and ethics, uh, a segment that has tremendous impact on society. And therefore, we're here today with author Massimo Aroldi, um, who wrote an absolutely brilliant book called The Machine Habitus. Uh, we'll be talking about the book here. Um, Massimo is a sociologist and assistant professor of sociology at the University of Milan. Just quickly looking at Massimo, if that's still correct, because we've made a mistake with that before. And no, no, it's good, it's good. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's true. Thank you. I mean, All right. Hello, everybody. Good. Yeah, okay. So um, a little bit about myself before we turn to Massimo and the book. Um, I myself am Michael Bass. Um, I usually go by Michael in international settings, so feel free to call me Michael. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow with the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology, which is based in Halle, uh, a small town uh, about one and a half hours from Berlin in Germany. Uh, I myself am Dutch, uh, and I kind of shuttle up and down between Amsterdam and Halle. Um, in my current project, I'm developing an anthropological approach to AI, and in particular, I'm an interest interested in the question how we cohabitate and co-create with AI. And instead of thinking of AI in terms of a, of a future scenario or some kind of dystopic variety, uh, I myself am more interested in how we live and work with AI. In the earlier stages of, of my project, I, I mainly looked into the way artists and creative professionals in India make use of AI. But I'm also very interested in the way data scientists or software engineers in Bangalore work with AI. How do they relate to questions of intelligence, bias, ethics, etc.? And it's for this reason that I came across uh, Massimo's book. It's one of the few serious publications, serious academic publications within the social sciences that engages with the kind of questions that AI evokes in, in social and cultural terms. In fact, the book is presented as a sociological take of AI. It's an incredibly well-researched but nuanced work that brings together a wealth of literature and perception perceptions. At the heart of the text is the idea of the machine habitus itself, something we'll be talking more about today. Um, but first, Massimo will provide a brief overview of the book himself through by means of slides, and this will last for about 20 minutes, after which I will kick off with some questions of my own. And after that, we hope you all will join the discussion with your own questions. Um, without much further ado, over to you, Massimo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. I mean, for the nice words, and thank you also to the book club uh, and Asjik for for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to start, uh, if you don't mind, with uh, with a quick presentation to introduce the main ideas of the book. I'll, I'll share my screen. In one second, just tell me if you can see it correctly. All right, can you see the presentation? Excellent. So, so this is the cover, and uh, as you can see, <clears throat> the key idea of the book is to put forward this sociology of algorithms. Now, uh, probably the audience here knows uh, quite well uh, how to uh, develop or, or, or to program uh, an algorithmic system or an AI um, model. Uh, here, the take is how to understand these systems a bit like Michael said, I mean, how to understand how they, what's their role in society? What's the, how do they uh, participate in society? Uh, and also on the other end, how society uh, contributes to make them what they are. How the culture enters the code and the code enters the culture and participate in the culture. The, these are like the two uh, sides of the book that put forward this idea of a uh, machine habitus. Uh, the, idea, the, the term habitus might not be uh, well known outside uh, the social sciences. Uh, is a is a term put forward and developed by um, a reuse. Also, it, it had different it had different uh, long history, but it was used by 
uh, famously used by Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist, very famous one. Um, and here, the idea of machine habitus is a sort of extension of this idea of habitus that I will explain uh, later on to the uh, world of machine learning systems, of the algorithmic systems that populate uh, social media platforms, devices, and almost any uh, field of social life now actually is uh, to some extent affected uh, by algorithmic systems um, of different kinds. So the presentation will basically uh, clarify three main points. On the one hand, how uh, the code, these machine learning systems, these algorithmic systems shape the culture and the society we live in. So the code in the culture. On the other hand, uh, the culture in the code. So how society uh, is encoded in the algorithmic systems uh, that uh, are developed and that uh, we delegate our decisions to. And the third point is the more maybe abstract and sociological in kind is this idea of techno-social reproduction meaning we cannot understand how society works, how the social order, how the different inequalities, for instance, that uh, constitute society um, work, are maintained, are reproduced, if we do not consider also algorithmic systems and uh, these technologies that are more and more present in our everyday life. First, a very quick, uh, let's say, premise here, I mean, algorithms, you see the book is a sociology of algorithms, but I'm fully aware as you are probably that algorithm is a very generic word, a, a term. I mean, algorithm is a mathematical procedure. It has been such um, also uh, thousands of years ago. I mean, it's something that can be done uh, by hand uh, with, with pen and paper. Uh, it's something that has been at the root of computer science as a discipline especially with the development of uh, digital computers. But uh, what I, I, my starting point in the book is that with machine learning, we are, we are, we are witnessing a, an important shift, which is a shift in, it's at the same time, a, a qualitative shift, meaning the type of algorithms that are embedded in our everyday life and the work and practices are significantly different from the, rule following models that characterize the so-called paradigm of our good old fashioned artificial intelligence. Yeah. In, uh, the, these new models are, are, have a sort of, um, they learn from data, you know that. So it's not a deductive logic that guides them based on rules decided by humans a priori, it's a learning inductive logic that animates their, their behavior. And, this is the qualitative shift. And then there is also the quantitative shift, meaning these systems are everywhere, the, from uh, streaming platforms to social media platforms, to the filters on my phone, to the spam filters in my emails, to the um, DALI uh, through which I can experiment making new uh, images. They are everywhere. They filter content. They are used to decide whether I will have a loan or not you know, to buy a house. And so they are very, very important to, to, to an extent that is unprecedented. And this is also due to the uh, progressive datafication uh, of our everyday life. The fact that now in this so-called platform era, that's how I call it in the, in the book, and uh, in this uh, periodization, uh, this period here starts uh, ideally with the, the Google, with the page rank, an algorithm that is a machine learning system, an unsupervised machine learning system, basically, that is uh, autonomous in its, um, in its working and that really ranks and uh, manipulates in almost real time uh, the, the, the internet and the, the, the pages and the, the knowledge available on the internet. And that's a really, uh, for me, the start of this platform era where data are everywhere. And these data are, of course, as you know, the the, the needed, uh, the, the, what we need to develop these models, what we need to train these models uh, to make them uh, intelligent. Uh, as some scholars said, is, I mean, it's some, a sort of an extraction of human cognitive abilities that are given to a machine, to a technology. So it's not a machine to be intelligent to some extent, uh, it's uh, uh, the, the data that are in that. Machine learning is what allowed me to, to produce these, uh, 
his image. Here we have philosopher Michel Foucault cooking an omelette, right? And <laughs> how is that possible? Of course, because you know that machine learning, we have available uh, pictures of Michel Foucault, of course, in black and white. That's why uh, Foucault in the, in the image is, is black, in black and white and the omelette is yellow because we have uh, images of omelette uh, in, in color, but not of Michel Foucault. So, I mean, this is, of course, one of the latest, let's say, funny developments of machine learning, but of course, we have many others. We have many others because the code is everywhere in the culture. The code is, for instance, in this, uh, uh, in an app like Tinder, we've, we try to find our partners and we are presented with a selection of possible partners to interact with. But here, what we tend to interpret, uh, especially if we, if we are like, uh, and not familiar with uh, AI, with machine learning. Here, this uh, exchange here between the user and the app is an interaction. Is an interaction, is a feedback loop to be more precise. Let me present you why I think it's very relevant when we examine what's the role of the code in the culture, this idea of feedback loop. Because here, of course, we have an interaction where you have a selection of content proposed to the user. The user decides whether to swap left or right. And this is a feedback given to the system that will adapt in a new iteration the uh, recommendations uh, to the user. Uh, these, these are important elements of, uh, uh, that we need to consider, especially if you are, like me, a sociologist interested in how society works. We must take, uh, uh, pay attention to how really uh, these systems, these algorithmic systems, like for instance, recommendation systems, produce these sort of feedback loops in the culture, in society. Uh, feedback loops means th th these technical systems are rooted back. <laughs> are, uh, are the system feeds back into itself. So of course, I watch videos of, uh, of cats of, uh, on, on YouTube and the, or TikTok even more. And the more I watch videos with, with cats, for instance, the more I will receive recommendations of videos about the subject in the sort of, in what in cybernetics is called positive feedback loop. Mm. Uh, on the other end, of course, I might decide to stop watching these videos and uh, skip skipping them and watching videos of uh, dogs, for instance. And in that case, after a while, the system will of course adapt uh, to, my, to my shift in, in behavior. What is less considered, uh, let's say, uh, is starting now so in computer science literature to be, to be considered, like in the case of these two papers, is the fact that when we have this kind of positive feedback loops, the risk is that we are producing what is called filter bubbles and as a result, echo chambers, meaning this amplification effect uh, by which we tend to be exposed to a, selected, uh, uh, to a selection of content that reflects our previous paths or choices. And this, sociologically speaking, has important implications that go also beyond the pure electoral consequences of that, for instance, in terms of public opinion, in terms of the filter bubble of the liberals and the Republicans, for instance, in the US. There is more to that because of course, these feedback loops are also about the advertisings that we see or the type of music that we listen to. These feedback loops are everywhere. Hmm? And uh, with them, they bring also a, the important notion of bias, for instance, I mean, uh, here, uh, it's something that is more and more, as you also witnessed with this book club, um, the, the notion, the relevance of the notion of bias is more and more uh, key in, in current uh, computer science, for instance, and beyond computer science. And here, I mean, it's important, I think, to imagine, to understand bias in relation to this feedback loop, to, to understand, especially in the case of machine learning systems that are embedded in digital platforms and that react kind of in real time to the decisions and behaviors of the users, it's important to really consider these systems as sort of participants in society. That's the idea that I try to put forward here. So instead of looking, uh, treating them sociologically or um, in the humanities, for instance, as sort of inanimate technologies, a sort of uh, inanimate uh, background of our social life, we need to treat these kind of intelligent technologies as sort of participants that through their classifications, through their uh, selections, through their orderings of uh, knowledge, culture, information, they participate in society. 
and they interact with us in this multiple uh, feedback loop that we encounter every day, even without noticing them. So is soci the sociology of algorithm, of course, must be interested in how do these artificial social agents participate in society and with what consequences. But then there is another point here, the culture in the code. Yes, the code is in the culture. The code uh, affects uh, the public opinion, our musical taste probably, our, the products we purchase or the people we interact with on social media. But at the same time, our society, our culture, our perspectives are in the code of machine learning systems, especially in the code of machine learning systems because of the data. Uh, and of course, you might know, as uh, especially those of you that are developers or programmers, that in the end, I mean, the culture is in the code simply because we are the ones that provide the classifications these systems uh, are trained on, okay? Uh, the case of recaptcha is, is quite clear, right? We are, while proving that we're not robots, we are basically instructing and uh, providing data for the training of probably a Google car or something else. It's important, sociologically speaking, not to, to a, a bit to take distance from the myth of the neutrality of technology, it, of considering technologies as something that is independent from society. We know that is not true. Especially we know that if we are have program and develop the machine learning system ourselves. Because if you think about that, how many choices we make about what data to, to use, about what threshold uh, implement, uh, what type of goals the system must follow. I mean, these are all human decisions that are made, for instance, by one type of humans behind machines, which are, who are, for instance, the, the creators of the machines, right? Which of course, because of their characteristics, also social demographic characteristics then eventually to put forward specific visions of the world. But what I'm mostly interested in are those that train these machine, system, machine learning system, those that provide the data, which are on the one end, the click workers, for instance, that we might recruit in order to uh, annotate images for a computer vision system. But on the other end are us, whenever we skip a video, whenever we like a post on social media, whenever we navigate TikTok or other platforms, we are the machine trainers. Our culture are, is datafied. Our ideas, our perspectives on the world, our behaviors are datafied and serve as base for the training of machine learning system. This is very important to consider because to some extent, this makes, I think, relevant to shift from the idea of garbage in, garbage out, that you know well, uh, the, the idea that, of course, the type of uh, input data, the type of uh, decisions that we make in the development of an algorithm impact on what the results of this, uh, of this model, of this algorithm. But more than that, it's not just garbage, it's society. What's in, in these, these data, data are never neutral. They always carry some visions of society, some tacit uh, understandings of the world, especially if we're talking about human generated data, texts or images or uh, patterns in consumption or in interaction. These are all data that carry the traces of some social worlds, not just of individual characteristics. Because of course, that's also the narrative of the marketing and, and, and also computer science to some extent. The idea that with recommender systems, we discover your needs, your desires. But these needs and desires, as sociologists, we know they are never unique. They will depend on the background of people, on whether they live in India or in Italy, whether they live in the city center in a very expensive flat or in the suburbs or whether they are highly educated or not. These are the variables that count when it comes to understand what people do, what people uh, think. And then these very same variables, we find them also in the data sets, to some extent used to train machine learning systems. This is a data set image, and you might know it, that uh, some years ago was featuring this sort of classifications and this classification bird the imprint of specific vision, visions, understanding of the world. So my proposal is to move forward from the idea of, to, to 
kind of leave aside this idea of bias that has monopolized a bit the debate about ethics and machine learning, and, and, and to think about the data as sort of context, uh, to, to bring back the idea of context in the data we train machine learning with. Because we know that the data cannot be representative of all societies. We know that the system trained on, on data, for instance, from the Cornell Movie Dialogues Corpus here, a famous data set used to train chatbots, hmm, we cannot be neutral simply because these, the movies in this uh, movie dialogue corpus are uh, American movies, are Hollywood movies, are, are not movies from Bollywood. So probably the type of social interactions between, for instance, may, um, male and females, between uh, old and young, between uh, uh, rich and poor, uh, the type of ways of speaking, the types of masculinity displayed, the type of uh, ideas and imagination that is displayed in this movie is simply not the same as in the movies produced in another country. And nonetheless, that's the, the, the root of machine learning if you, if you uh, train a system with this type of data set. So these systems, is certainly, it is like if they practically learn example by example, some cultural propensities, propensities to act in specific ways. Uh, and these are learned from the data patterns that are extracted from the crowds of machine traders that also reflect the position in the social space, allow me this sociological term, of these individuals and the related biases. I mean, Dali, rich people having a party, poor people having a party, okay? It's common sense. Rich people are different than poor people, right? Rich people having a party of smart dresses and fancy gloves and nice cocktails in uh, nice nightclubs, while the poor people having a party are I mean, probably uh, doing some barbecue uh, outside. And you might notice also that the share of uh, black individuals in the, in, in the representation on the right of the screen is much higher than those, uh, the, 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 the one on the left, simply because probably Dali knows from the images it has been trained on that they, there's more white people that is rich than black people. Uh, so, I mean, these are biases, of course, but we can see them more uh, in a more abstract and sociological manner as the consequences of this data context that bear the imprint of the social world they are produced from. And the same can be said of something as banal as your Discover Weekly on Spotify. The personalized suggestions that you receive on Spotify are not just personalized because you like, you are the only one that like, I don't know, uh, jazz music or specific kind of uh, trap music or whatever. They amplify your taste. And by amplifying and reproposing things that is familiar to you that you might like, and so producing what it could be seen also as a filter bubble to some extent, a musical filter bubble, they do not just reproduce your taste, they reproduce and amplify the taste uh, that is characteristic of a specific background, for instance, of your of people of your social class, of your with your educational background, of the, with, of, from your position in, in, uh, in, in the world. It's like if we are socializing the system. It's like if, of course, these systems are not uh, part of our world. Of course, I don't think they are sanctioned, okay? But I think that uh, it's even the most banal spam filter or recommendation system is kind of socialized uh, as a sort of proto-socialization through which it becomes a member of society with specific characteristics based on the type of data context it has been fed with. And I'm concluding uh, with uh, this explaining now why I think this idea of machine habitus is relevant. Uh, because we, you know, if you do machine learning, that, I mean, machines learn in a dispractical manner, right? Example after example. Of course, thousands, millions of examples, but example-based learning, uh, they don't need rules predetermined uh, a priori. Machine learn what people know implicitly, machine writes. And you know, if you if you teach a neural network how to classify whether to, to, how to recognize a cat or a dog, of course, 
uh, you don't need to explain a priori what a cat is and what a dog is. It is this knowledge is inductively derived from patterns in data. And this brings me to this notion of habitus by Pierre Bourdieu. I mean, what is habitus according to Bourdieu? Uh, habitus, it's a system of disposition, is a, a set of schemes through which we see the world, to which we act in the world. And uh, uh, the, uh, what Bourdieu proposed was that these schemes, these uh, ways of classifying the words are not individual uh, characteristics, are not uh, just a matter of uh, uh, the psychology of an individual, of the personality of an individual, they depend on the experiences uh, of people. And these experiences are socially conditioned, are conditioned by the fact that you grow up in a big flat with a lot of books or in a slum with no books and no running water. And that makes the difference in the way then you perceive the world, you classify the world, you understand the world. So the idea here is that we can shift, we can say, okay, uh, these embodied systems, uh, these dispositions that guide our actions without us even understanding them, without us even being aware of that. I mean, machine learning systems have something similar, have these uh, schemes these, uh, that they derive from patterns in data that make them act and classify the world in specific ways without the need for them to be sentient or conscious. Uh, and uh, you can see also from this quote here, there is really, even in the jargon that sociologists, uh, sociologists use to, to define habitus, there is this statistical kind of uh, terminology. The habitus is something that biases our implicit micro anticipations of the kind of work that we will encounter at each moment, expecting the future to preserve the experiential correlations encountered in the past. You see, what is what are these experiential correlations if not the really the root of machine learning. What is in the data we train machine learning with, if not this sort of experiential correlation of the people that train this system that produce this data? And even Bourdieu himself at some point said, okay, maybe the habitus is a little bit like a computer program, a programmed ordinator. And we can see it that way. So that's why I think this metaphor could be useful. I mean, this is the misclassification of Facebook's the content uh, um, moderator, automated uh, content moderator uh, is in Italian. Basically, this panna cotta, Blackberry panna cotta was wrongly classified as violent. It's the violent image. Okay? Uh, it's not, but we can understand the machine habitus behind it. We can understand the type of images this uh, system has been trained on because it's a quite splatter panna cotta. It's a bit like a Tarantino like panna cotta, right? We see all these <clears throat> juice, which is a bit like blood. And that's the machine habitus. It's in this sort of ways of seeing the world, right? That we are now giving to machine learning systems too. <coughs> this means we have responsibilities. We have responsibilities because if we are providing these systems with ways of reasoning, of producing the world, of classifying order in the world, that depend on these dispositions that are not neutral, that reflect inequalities, that reflect uh, historical patterns of uh, power distribution of, uh, of, of uh, cultural traditions, we must ask, okay, to what extent, what kind of uh, social order we are making machines reproducing? And this is something I briefly uh, tried to study, for instance, in a recent paper, when I asked myself, okay, uh, on, on YouTube, a lot of people listen music uh, through YouTube, uh, and um, on YouTube, there are no music genres. So it, it's interesting to see whether the recommendation system of, of YouTube, the related videos uh, algorithm, is uh, kind of uh, um, recommending music videos also based on their genre. Because this would mean that it reproduces from the data it is fed with some cultural patterns that is there, some boundaries in taste. And they found out with this empirical investigation that 90% of music videos recommended together by the relative videos algorithm on YouTube are of the same music genre. Given a video A, the recommendation B has 90% probability to be of the same music genre. So you see, there is a reproduction of these cultural uh, 
a logic of, of music genre, which is not necessarily the only way in which one could listen to music or understand music, it's reproduced by this technical system. And at the same time, I looked at how uh, YouTube users also interacted with music and discovered basically that also music listeners, even in this very fluid and uh, democratic, let's say, uh, in, in way of listening to music that characterized the digital era were more than, uh, let's say, the majority, the vast majority was listening to uh, music only of one genre. So one could ask, okay, what, what's, the, what, what's going on here? Is the system is recommending videos of the same music genre because it derives, it, it uh, relies on the patterns of the users or it's the other way around, meaning, Maybe the system, by proposing videos of the same genre, encourages the users to listen to music in that way. And now my uh, provocation is that it's almost impossible to answer right now to this question because machine learning and uh, human beings are so intertwined in the making of society that it's almost impossible to, to disentangle them. Thank you very much. Right. All right. Thank you, Massimo. I mean, that would, that was great. I mean, I, I read the book probably two, three months ago. So this was an excellent refresher again to, uh, and kind of also through it, you, you showcase the, the depth the book offers, but also the nuance. And, um, and, and kind of sort of the way you've also, um, the book builds upon such a vast amount of literature. I mean, it must have been a, a colossal task to even sort through all of that and uh, uh, while reading it I thought an, an AI could have helped you probably with that like you know so maybe at some point um, we'll have a Delhi version or oh, we already do apparently because no, I mean Google <laughs> Scholar was, was, yeah. <laughs> was enough already it was yeah. already quite, quite yeah. good system. maybe at some point but it made me also aware of um, how much there already is out there but um how much we also need studies that make sense of that kind of wealth of information to, to push the, the discussion in, in new directions. So I've prepared some questions. Um, some of it you've already kind of touched upon a little bit, but I don't think it's a, it's bad to repeat some of it because um, for some of the audience, some of the sociological terminology might be a little new. Um, but let's start with something that I thought was very fascinating at the very start of your book. Um, you you started with uh, which are kind of sort of a science art project, um, IACOS or I A Q O S. Um, I don't know if there's a different way of pronouncing it in Italian. Um, yeah, IACOS might be IACOS yeah, might be the, yeah. the way we we pronounce it. Yes. Yeah. Can you can you tell us a bit how you what it is um, and how you came across it? Thank you for, for this question. Uh, I'm very touched by this question, and, and I will explain you why uh, in, in one moment. Basically, Yakos yeah. is a neighborhood open source artificial intelligence system. It's a sort of art, an, an art project yeah. by two uh, wonderful human beings, uh, uh, Salvatore Iaconese and Doriana Persico, artists, um, engineers, acres and many other things is very hard to, to classify them but they were basically um, the idea is quite simple they introduced in in a, in a peripheral semi-peripheral district of the city of rome a simple kind of a, a system which were algorithmic system based on neural networks which was able to basically interact in natural language with uh, people and that was trained based only based on the solely on, on the knowledge and terms and voices and uh, documents produced by people from that neighborhood, the neighborhood of Torpignata. So basically, in this neighborhood, this AI wasn't connected to Wikipedia or Google News or, or Twitter. It was an AI that was trained as a sort of member of this neighborhood, of this district. And uh, by doing so, what, what they wanted to, to show 
was on the one hand the possibility that uh, AI and machine learning can be used as tools for making connections among people. Because in the end, the system was implemented on uh, tablets and uh, the small devices that were uh, put in, in, in the bars and cafes in the school of, of the district. And you had people uh, interacting with these systems and uh, presenting to them some questions. And uh, if, the, for instance, I, some school, school kids asked to, uh, to, to Yakos, what is an Australopithecus? And, and Yakos said, I don't know. And so basically they organized and they provided an answer to that question. And that's the answer to that question that now probably that system would give because yeah. that's the only way, I mean, that's the way in which it is trained through this interaction, a bit like us, a bit like us human beings. Um, so this system was a very interesting example uh, for me to, to show how we can really see uh, this idea of AI systems, machine learning systems as socialized, as kind of uh, be trained with data that cannot but reflect the specificities, the cultural specificities of a specific context, a specific neighborhood. Because in this case, this neighborhood is a semi-peripheral neighborhood, quite poor one, a multicultural, <coughs> very different from other neighbors, richer neighbors of the city of Rome, for instance. And the type of imaginary that is then uh, encapsulated in the ter terms that uh, uh, Yakos would employ in conversation in the types of topics that it has learned about is very much reflecting the specific social background, the specific social characteristics of this neighborhood. And I was saying that I'm touched by this question and uh, I'm really happy to talk about it because Salvatore Iaconesi, one of the two authors of this, uh, of this art project, uh, unfortunately died uh, yesterday. So it, it was, uh, but I encourage you to, to look, look up his work. Uh, Salvatore Iaconesi, uh, if you look for him, search for him also on Google or on other search engines, you will see that he has been uh, fighting with cancer uh, since a while now. And uh, he is an acre and he opened up the, the results of his uh, examinations in order to make his, the cure to his disease an open access enterprise. He also did, did a, a TED talk on that in the past years. At some point the cancer was, uh, was disappeared, but now unfortunately it has he came back and uh, he, he, he basically uh, he, he killed him. So um, um, for me, it's a, thank you for the question. It's, it's a way for me also to, to, to recognize, uh, acknowledge the, the, the big contribution that his thinking uh, had on the development also of this book. Because this art project is an art project that really was able to, I think, bring, uh, um, bring out the many sociological and social aspects of AI. So look it up, Yakos yeah. Salvatore Iacanesi. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, obviously it, it caught my attention immediately working with um, artists um, uh, whose work I've been following for a while now in India. And um, it is remarkable um, how this particular project also provides such a, a rich way into the material, but it also kind of is revealing for um, how, how this kind of sort of interaction also can be so productive for, for people on the street. And we see, don't see enough of that yet, kind of sort of to understand what AI is, which is a, a question that I find particularly interesting, not in terms of its technological, technical answer, um, but mainly as one that evokes so many mixed feelings and is kind of revealing for the way we relate to this technology. But obviously I'm incredibly sad to hear uh, about his passing. Um, but wonderful that we could at least um, uh, talk about his work here a little bit. Um, I'll do probably one more question and then uh, we'll see from the audience as well, because as always time is short. Um, so one of the questions I was thinking of, and I, I was hoping you could say a bit more about that is that much has been made of the intelligence in AI. You already mentioned um, a few things about it. And we, we could think of intelligence in, in, a, in many multiple kinds of, sort of ways, myriad of ways. Uh, we can think of it as agency, as autonomy, or even consciousness, awareness. 
Uh, more recently, there was this incident at Google where an engineer claimed that the AI they were working with is sentient. Um, I believe um, he was initially put on hold and probably now was fired. Uh, of course, it caused an enormous storm. Uh, what do you make of such claims from a sociological point of view? How, how can we approach it without kind of succumbing to the technicalities of what AI is? Thank you for the question. Uh, let me say that as a, let's say, putting aside sociology for a while, I'm very much fascinated by this, as anyone, I think, with the, also with an interest in science fiction, I think, uh, is uh, regarding these, uh, these issues of the possibility of artificial intelligence. But as a sociologist, to be honest, this is not a question that interests me much, and I will explain you why. Because I think that um, the point here is not whether the, the AI system is conscious or sentient, also because it's not very easy to determine that, to be honest, in a sort of objective scientific manner, which wasn't the case uh, uh, in the case of, of this Google um, employee, actually, but um, what's interesting, what's particularly interesting, if we want to understand the impact of these technologies on society, on social life more in general, is whether they have the, the capacity to communicate, uh, to, to interact, to shape society and culture. So to, it's, like, it's like a secondary question, to some extent, whether they are really intelligent or not, because uh, um, probably the point here is on whether uh, these systems can communicate with us. And this is a point that I'm not the only one making, because also Elena Esposito, uh, another Italian sociologist that has been working a lot um, in Germany, uh, has been made in a recent book on artificial communication. So the key idea is that, okay, maybe these systems are intelligent, maybe are not, but what's, what matters here is that they are able to manipulate culture, to manipulate language, communication, and interact with us. And I think now we are at a, an historical moment where we cannot deny that. Uh, even, even a banal spam filter, to some extent, that is separating my spam from a ham in my Google email, um, is already contributing like, to shaping my understanding of the world, right? And I interact with it anytime I flag an email as spam or phishing, right? And because this ad makes him, makes him or her or it, as you prefer, learn more from my perspective, right? From my classifications and adapt in a new iteration. It's 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 uh, it's working. So I mean, what I mean here is that. Um, uh, now, especially when we see, see something like Dali, or when we see language models, when we see incredibly advanced uh, ass digital assistants, it's impossible to deny that they can communicate, they can manipulate language, they can interact with us. And maybe that's what matters, because we have seen also from the literature from human-computer interaction, that even if uh, a person knows that Alexa is not uh, just conscious or doesn't, uh, is not like a human being, it, it, the, people is, is kind of uh, likely to treat Alexa uh, as a sort of agent in, in a conversation, uh, like uh, thanking Alexa or, or basically interacting as if uh, they're interacting with a family member. I mean, so to some extent, I mean, yes, intelligence is a very interesting question, probably more for cognitive scientists or other, other let's say, uh, branches of, of, of scientific research. In my case, I think in the case of sociology and the social scientists more broadly, I think the main focus should be, okay, we need to understand how do these systems change society? How do they transform interaction? How do they intervene in very subtle ways and often not very transparent ways in the way we know, we consume, we get informed and we interact with each other? I don't know if I answered the question. So, so let's let's take one from from the audience. Uh, we have a question from Steppenwolf um, because the song now is immediately playing in the back of my mind. That's another AI thing, I guess. But the recommendation bias has been flowing through our systems over ten plus years now. Um, what do you think of the do not track uh, slash privacy systems and impact they will have on these echo chambers? 
It's a very good question. Yes, more and more people, of course, is adopting some kind of ad blocker or systems for reducing uh, the, the flow of information, private information um, to, to companies. Uh, still, I mean, from there is also a strand of, of, of research in uh, me, media research, communication science and sociology that studies, for instance, how uh, users, how people basically relate with technologies and AI systems, whether, for instance, they are aware of the fact that they, there is a recommendation system there or that, for instance, whether they are aware that their newsfeed on Facebook uh, is basically the result of an algorithmic process or not. And unfortunately, you know, the, the behavior, I mean, those that are using ad blockers or the sort of, of uh, sophisticated systems to resist the kind of the, the the pressure by platforms to, to to extract data are a very minority, unfortunately. Meaning, the large majority of people um, actually tend to forget about these issues, as they do with the, the uh, terms and, uh, um, and conditions of uh, the apps they install on their phone. And this is also correlated with uh, some social demographic factors: people with uh, a technical education, people with uh, high education, tend to be more concerned by these issues of privacy, whether people with lower education, for instance, they tend to be less aware of them. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this is another aspect of the way in which we need to really pay attention to these issues because there is also the risk of a gap between those that are more skilled and prepared not to be manipulated, for instance, the case of electoral uh, campaigns, for instance, on social media, and those that, that are more uh, kind of being uh, manipulated because they don't have the cultural uh, instruments to, to, to make sense of what's going on on these environments. Uh, so yes, I mean, uh, maybe it will change, make the difference a little, but only a little bit, because they, yeah. I think for the majority of the population, this is a known issue. Right, um, you're giving me a lot to think about again. Um, we have a question from Fikas Chahar. Um, is asking for your thoughts on religious texts as algorithms and its relevance in contemporary world. Anything um, you know about this? So, a religious text, you mean? Oh, I can just copy it quickly, probably Thank you. your text. Uh, um, direct message, how do I do that? This way, there you go. So then you can read through the question as well. <laughs> religious right. texts as algorithms but if they are algorithms they are rule following systems for sure meaning i mean uh if i have interpreted correctly the question meaning you think that we can kind of interpret uh religious texts like the bible or uh, the, the quran as uh, algorithms so it's yeah it's, it's a fascinating question i don't i don't think i have a specific answer uh, for sure, um, if they are algorithm, meaning because they indicate some sets of procedure to, to get the specific output, which is probably immortality or eternal, uh, the paradise or whatever, like uh, paradise I, versus, uh, <laughs> versus uh, yeah. hell uh, sort of output. I think they're not like machine learning, the machine learning systems I've been talking about, I think. I can I can maybe add a little bit here. A friend of mine, uh, Professor Bart Barendrecht of Leiden University, has recently gotten a, a large grant uh, from the EU to look into this, um, uh, specifically addressing questions of Islam in Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Um, so if you think of it like a, as a tool on your app, increasingly uh, people use, for instance, AI technology to, to ask questions about the Hadith. So not so much the Quran, but the, the law text, so kind of sort of everything that has ever been said and uh, attributed either to the prophet or, or otherwise. Um, so people do use these technologies kind of to find an answer, but also in terms of, for instance, uh, food, like if something is haram or not. Uh, kind of, you know, if you have a question, uh, if you have a product that you see in the supermarket and it isn't entirely clear um, what, you know, it was made of or what kind of factory, there is a way kind of sort of, so it's also kind of, a, a, you know, as a tool to sort through that 
massiveness of information, but it has an impact uh, on, um, uh, on how people then behave as religious people. Another example that comes to mind is actually one that I'm, I'm writing about right now, uh, which is a, an artist from Kerala, Sliva Paul, who did some experiments with this um, from the perspective of the Syrian Christian community, where he experimented with um, if, if it was possible for AI to generate kind of alternative Bible texts, and if people would pick up on them. Uh, and he, he has a very interesting TED talk about that, which you can find very easily. His name is Sliva Paul, incredibly clever uh, guy. I met him in Cochin uh, earlier this year. Um, so there's there's lots going on in this field as well, and obviously it will have an impact. Uh, I hope um, because that this answers your question a little bit. Um, it's fascinating. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, um, kind of. If we move towards um, um, the end of the session, I mean, if there uh, if there are more questions from the audience, uh, I'm sure David will let me know. Um, but meanwhile, I, I thought let me. Um, ask you, where do you think we are heading next in terms of AI research, uh, especially from the social sciences? Uh, where, where should we train our attention? What's, what should set the agenda the coming years, you feel? Thank you. Um, yes, of course, I can talk only about uh, the sort of social science research on AI, yeah. uh, because that's my field. Um, and regarding that field, for sure, what we are seeing is that we are something that is already happening is that we are moving away from the kind of naive idea of uh, AI manipulating humans, for sure, which is already a good step forward, meaning the idea that, yes, uh, for instance, in the aftermath of the Cambridge Analytica case, for instance, there were a lot of uh, discourses about, okay, or they are using algorithms, and these algorithms can basically change uh, the world, change uh, the electoral results, and manipulate the mind of people. Remember, to target the inner demos of people was the, the words that were used by one of the whistleblowers in, in that specific case of Cambridge Analytica. So now we are moving, we are problematizing this assumption of, uh, uh, of a bit naive assumption of a sort of an AI system or that is able to manipulate and manipulate a human being because, I mean, the way in which a system that classifies and recommends information works is not that like like a magic bullet that automatically uh, changes the mind of the people are, that are exposed to this content. People always, I mean, if we think about also the relation that we have with the, the recommendation systems we encounter in our everyday life. We don't listen to everything that is proposed to us in music. We don't read any recommended news or recommended product. We are often pissed off with the recommendations or the ads that we receive. We are, we resist to some extent, algorithmic system, recommendation systems all the time. And that's yeah. also with that blocker and this kind of system we were mentioning, which means that we cannot take for granted, okay, we, we cannot say, okay, have embraced the apocalyptic uh, sort of uh, idea that yes, AI is taking over the world, is manipulating our minds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because AI is always in, in interaction with the society and with us, and we have some agency to actually resist it. This agency, as I said, also depends on the on some social demographic variables like the level of education, for instance. And so, of course, that's this is an interesting complication that now it has been uh, recently studied. In the future, probably, uh, the, the really, I think that the, the what we lack, I think, is more data about how real life data, meaning uh, the type of data algorithms and platforms are, 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 are fed with, actually, in order to study really if uh, we can talk of filter bubbles, if we can really talk of uh, a sort of uh, um, uh, the creation, for instance, the, the, the polarization induced by filter bubbles, political polarization or cultural polarization, if we can really talk of the formation of uh, uh, eco chambers because of algorithmic systems. These are questions that scientists have tried to answer since a while now, but what they have been lacking so far is a lot of real life data. Why? Because these data are not 
available to researchers are owned by platforms. So the big issue here, probably when we talk about the critical study of AI or algorithms is not AI or algorithms, which can be perfectly fine. As in the case of Yakos, that was a real great system that was making good uh, in, a, in a specific neighborhood uh, yeah. because the data were open, were accessible. Here, the problem also in the study of AI uh, and the algorithmic system is that the data are not open. I mean, platforms are very, as you know, secretive uh, with their data. So it's very hard to really study the impact of the code in the culture. But unfortunately, there are some initiatives, for instance, uh, Tracking Exposed, an initiative uh, uh, which uh, by some uh, computer scientists and researchers in Amsterdam that have uh, created some browser extensions that uh, can be used to track what kinds of recommendations, personalized recommendations you receive on platforms such as Amazon, uh, YouTube, you, yeah. Pornhub, for instance, and, yeah. and others, and, and also probably very soon TikTok. This is yeah. probably a tool which can be very useful, of course, for the user also to realize when, and uh, problematizing your own uh, sort of bubble you live in, in a more kind of scientific manner, because then you get an Excel file or a CSV file with your all the recommendations that you have received in the past uh, few months, for instance. But it can be an extremely useful tool also for researchers that want to really study whether, for instance, algorithms change my taste in music, or whether algorithms change my consumption patterns or reproduce and amplify some inequalities. Yes, we have interviews, we have surveys, we have uh, in interviews with experts, analysis of data sets for in looking for biases, but we need something that I think is able to grasp better these ubiquitous interactions between humans and machine as they unfold on platforms, for instance. And I think the, what I would like to do and others also would like to do is really try to uh, study these things with real life data. And probably these new uh, tools will let us do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, the, I just thank you for this. I mean, it's, it's a very rich um, response, um, reflective of your work, I guess. Um, um, I just came out of a meeting myself with a, with a different team um, based in Bangalore and Pune. Uh, and we were talking about the implications for men, medical, uh, for mental health of uh you know of of ai use in various technologies and you see two sides one side is the 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 opportunistic one there's all sorts of things possible now uh in the broader field of medical health technologies and mental health technologies on the other hand there is now such an affluence of of apps that that offer more or less free um uh, ready to use products that almost by default start by asking um rather personal questions to give an example uh this morning i downloaded an app that caught my attention called stoic and i thought i wanted to see what it was um and uh and it the moment you start the app it asks how you're feeling and it asks how you're describing that but of course from the very beginning there is almost no clarity on where that data is being used i'm sure there is kind of sort of a something that you need to sign with your little name uh, you know ticking a box somewhere um but who goes through that almost nobody because that's way too long to read and nobody has time for that moreover these apps are specifically designed for busy people um that's what they all claim you know you only have to meditate for five minutes a day uh then you're done um but meanwhile we kind of sort of give up a lot of ourselves and we feed the um the app we feed its use uh and the data itself going to be employed for uh, in myriad ways um i saw one final uh kind of sort of question remark from Vickers um on um relating to the impact of recommendation engines on cultural diversity um any final thoughts to share on this well, really, I mean, I can repeat what I just said, meaning uh, I have the, also based on my own research, I have the impression that they, they do not enhance cultural diversity. They tend actually to create some cultural bubbles in general, yeah. but to more data. And that's what I'm working on actually with others. We need more data to really answer this question in a, in a kind of scientific manner because it, 
it also depends, we, I can say that it depends a lot on the platform. It depends a lot on the recommendation method. So we need also to be really attentive to the specificities, the technical specificities of the systems we are talking about and avoid to talk about algorithms or recommendation systems as in abstract terms, as if they are like all of the same kind, they're not. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Well, um, we've come to the end of this session. Um, first of all, thank you, Massimo. This was, uh, this was so rewarding, so interesting. Um, kind of reminds me that I need to read the book again. Um, for those of you who haven't read yet the book, get the book. Um, there's an e-version that I have for my Kindle. There's uh, He's holding it up. Um, it's, it's really wonderful also to have in paper. So you might as well buy both versions. Um, um, Thank you also Hasgeek for, uh, for organizing this and th David in particular for putting it together. Uh, truly wonderful doing this. Um, some final things um, that I was asked to say uh, before we round off is that um, oh, uh, the video of the session will be edited and uploaded in a week's time. Um, meanwhile, participants and interested persons are welcome to join Hasgeek's Telegram channel um, and the address probably will be shared is shared through the announcement. So let me not spell it out here. Uh, but through that, you can learn more about Hasgeek as well as the book club. Um, I must say that it's it's truly wonderful to be part of the, the Hasgeek community on Telegram. So I highly recommend it. Um, all right. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening ahead for those in India, elsewhere, um, here in mainland uh, Europe, we have a bit more of the afternoon to enjoy. Thank you, Michael. Thanks to the ASGIC uh, community. It's been a great pleasure for me. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks, audience. Thank you.